everybody magicians how are you hope you guys can see me clearly it's weird there's so much light here on the porch but i've had to move to various parts of the porch today to get some light because it's about to be evening so anyway how are you guys doing i wanted to do a live video today around feeling not good enough and the vow of invisibility and how it affects us in terms of saving and also how it affects us in terms of income because it's something that I keep seeing over and over again. So Mizo and I, if you don't know, my name is Vangile Makakwa and I'm the host of the Wealthy Money Magicians um, Facebook group, but I'm also the host of the Property Magicians podcast where we talk about property and my co-host is Mizo. And one of the things that we've been talking about this week um, that I noticed that really got me on a WhatsApp with her and had me losing my mind was how almost every week for the podcast, we ask an equal amount of men and women to come on the podcast, right? So we usually go after uh, men and women of color because we want to really highlight them, right? So we want to share their stories. We want them to share their stories as investors. And almost every week, the men that we ask are like, yes, hell yes, I'm on board. I can't wait to share, etc." We don't even know uh, much about their property portfolios. We just know that, oh, our certain people like students will message me and say, you must interview this person or Mizo will have met them somewhere or our former guests will message us and tell us that we really, really have to um, interview so-and-so almost all the time the men are just on board right the women not often right like very rarely do we get a yes from the women and now this is not about me bashing women because i have started actually asking them why are you saying no because it was just i'm like wow we're trying to showcase the full spectrum of um a property in terms of uh, South Africans and other um, African countries, right? So South Africa, Kenya, wherever. But we don't have a, we haven't met a lot of property investors in other African countries. So we have only one African country that we take most of our guests from right now, right? And we're working on that though. We're working super hard to change that. So right now it's mainly South Africa. And here's the thing that keeps coming up is, my story isn't that interesting. So when I ask the women why they're saying no, they say, I haven't done enough. My story isn't that interesting. It's not that amazing. And then sometimes we find out that they're making something like, I freaking kid you not, like 50,000 rand a month or more just on property, just by being a property investor like that. They cash, that's just a plain profit without any expenses, right? But there's this feeling that I haven't done enough. Oh, I'm not good enough. I've listened to the podcast and all the other guests sound so much more interesting, so much better than I am and so much more amazing than I am. So what can I possibly share that is so interesting? So I'm not good enough. And it's consistent. It is so bizarre and so interesting at the same time, right? Because this is literally the work that I teach around not feeling like you're enough, not feeling good enough. And today I really want to talk about that and talk about how this is a vow of invisibility. Because here's the flip side. I always tell them, I'm like, you know, people that come on our podcast, we have guests that ask to come on the podcast for a second time or a third time because the first time round they got so much business or so many any opportunities from the podcast that people listened and there's people on there that have money and they want to team up with investors and they just like oh my god I heard this person I resonated with them I want to partner with them I'll provide the money and that way your po your property portfolio grows we see this so often like most times we're like uh we don't want to have this guest again at least not until next year but this is the big, big difference that we're seeing. And 
right now what I've seen it as is very, very much gender based. And I understand where that's coming from. And I'm going to talk about why that is so deeply entrenched in black women because it's something that I myself have dealt with, right? And it's something that Mizo has had to deal with. It's this feeling of, it's this invisibility that the world, part of the world that we live in has worked so hard to make us invisible, to invisibilize us. But then we also take it on and it becomes part of our story, right? So let's talk about the trauma behind the vow of invisibility and this thought of not being good enough and then look at how it actually plays out in our lives, right? So for me, what I've seen, so let me just quickly talk about how I've seen this play out in my life, right? So for me, how I saw the vow of invisibility and not good enough play out was the minute I started my first business, right? Forget even this business. The first business totally flunked. Speak to be free, completely flunked because of this. And I, I didn't know. Everybody just told me to keep pushing through it, keep working through it, keep doing the practical work, work harder. And I believed it, right? So the first thing that I saw play out was that it was so hard for me to talk about me, talk about my work, what makes me a great asset to A, run the company, B, for people to work with me, hire me, get on board with me as, um, as someone that they work with in their companies or whatever, right? I just didn't know how to articulate that because a huge part of me was like, you are not good enough before um, if you want to run a business and show up and market yourself and be an expert, you must have like a resume this long. You must have been featured in ABCD magazines. You must have done all these media appearances. You must have just done the very most instead of looking at who I was and what I actually have right now, what I can actually do right now, right? I was constantly looking for outside validation. And also when I did get hired for things, I would always charge the bare minimum, the lowest of the low, because my belief was I can't charge what everyone else is charging because, oh my God, they have like all these accolades. They have all these amazing things to share, right? So already in terms of income, I could could see that now how I see that play out in terms of clients like I literally have clients that come to me for coaching and the first thing that we do is we work on the story around not being good enough and the vow of invisibility and the minute we start to change that story I kid you not they don't just quadruple their uh, their prices some of my clients have literally gone from I charge $75 to coaching to I charge like $5,000 to coaching with a client right? Because this is so deeply entrenched within us. Like they are brilliant at what they do. The results that they give clients are so incredible, but there is this deep feeling that I am not good enough or the market won't understand me or any of that. So they undercharge. What I see with uh, women that I've worked it with that have careers is that even before when they have a new job interviews, so you want a new job, we work on, uh, on that story around getting the new job and going to a start on the new job. And the first thing that actually happens is most times, instead of saying what's actually what actually you would usually charge for your qualifications most times because there's the story of I am not good enough and I haven't done enough I still have to do more before I can actually show up and be this person is like literally you can start charging at the same price that a new grad would be charging you know you'd literally say that salary instead of saying the salary that people on your level are charging or even more because you know that you bring what work experience you bring you know what results you get when you're in that position and it's such a difficult thing I keep seeing it over and over right so once we heal this not good enough what I have constantly seen is how people have been able to go on to like leave companies that are not appreciating them in terms of their uh, in terms of how they get paid in terms of how they treated benefits etc and then they're able to go and 
walk into a whole other company and because they believe and they know within themselves that as I am right now, I am enough, they are able to literally charge way, way more, ask for way, way more in terms of their salaries than they did before, right? So this is a big, big thing, right? There is this deep link between the vow of invisibility and not good enough because the vow of invisibility has so little to do with showing up in front of people. It is completely possible to be invisible and be in front of a million people and talking to a million people. Why? Because I can literally be talking, but be talking theory, be talking and showcasing my intelligence, but never getting, uh, letting people see me right? Talking all the theoretical things, talking all those things, but never sharing my story, never connecting with people, never allowing myself to be vulnerable, never allowing myself to be seen. And most times that's not a problem if you're not an entrepreneur, right? It's fine. You can always get by. But if you're an entrepreneur, part of the, a part of your marketing, part of who you are when you show up in the space before people can hire you is your story. It's sharing your story, even getting investors on board. They need to feel like they know you, they understand you, they resonate you with you in some way, right? So, it's so, but we don't, but if we feel like our story isn't good enough and we're not good enough, we'll always be just showing up in terms of intelligence, but never understanding why people never feel like they can trust us enough to buy from us because they never feel like they see you, the person, right? So in terms of um, running your own business, your own side hustle, up leveling your business, a huge part of it is allowing ourselves to be seen, right? It is a big thing like I keep like I've been saying with the podcast part of the podcast is yes we are sharing that people are coming on and teaching us about real estate but if you look at the podcast most people are sharing their stories the questions that we ask are really personal store uh, personalized stories and people are sharing their stories that's why we get emails from uh, investors that come on the podcast and say to us oh my god I just got five new deals five new people want to put in money with me they want to do business with me they want to do a b c d with me why because they just heard your story they feel like they know you, they understand you, they know where, where you're coming from. And that starts to build trust. And if you're asking people to invest a lot of money in something, they want to know who you are, what you're about. And that is how you build trust, right? But if we are living and believing that whatever we have to share isn't good enough, then we're missing all these opportunities, This opp these opportunities to connect with people on those deeper levels, right? So let's talk about why we even have our vows of invisibility and why we have these deep beliefs of not being good enough and where they come from. Because it's not, because I know everybody always says like, believe in yourself, you know, wake up, look in the mirror and tell yourself you have a shit. And I did that for years and I, it did nothing for me, right? Like I was like, I still believe that I'm not good enough. And I was watching, trust me when I say I was doing all the things that people were telling me to do because I was watching my first company go downhill and yet I couldn't understand why is it that I can't just outright tell people that I'm great at this that I can really do this why am I invisibilizing myself so what happened when I started wealthy money was I saw a similar thing starting with me right so I start this company, I've written the book, Heart, Mind and Money, it's doing well, people love it, people are sending great emails, it's selling well at the shops, my publishers are happy, everything should be great, right? And I'm like, okay, I also have an MBA, I also know how to talk about the core financial things if we need to talk about investments, but really my thing is about the emotional stuff. 
And I can't talk about the emotional stuff, right? I couldn't really fully talk about the emotional stuff, the spirit of money meditations, all the other meditations that I do in the Money Magic course. Like I couldn't say, oh, by the way, I have a meditation, which by the way, we do. We have tons of meditations in the Creating Money Magic course around the vow of invisibility, around not good enough, and really deconstructing this trauma. And I couldn't do that. So one day I go to my dad after a while and I'm like, you know, I think that the one thing that's going to make this company grow and not tank like the last company is I need to go do a PhD in economics. That's really what I need to do. So then I'll have my MBA, I'll have the book, and then I'll have the PhD in economics, and then nobody will be able to question my qualifications, you know? And of course, my dad, who has made no bones about always wishing that one of his kids would be an academic and do a PhD, right, in anything. My dad has always been like, I don't care if you do a PhD in like, um, I don't know, <laughs> like looking at roses or smelling roses just like that would be just so like having an academic as one of my kids so obviously his thing is like oh my god that sounds amazing because he's seeing his whole dream come to life as i'm proposing this phd in economics right so luckily Ta-da, because I do the work, because I'd been doing the work, even though at that time I wasn't teaching the meditations and I wasn't teaching the um, uh, emotional stuff because I thought, oh my God, for me to teach the emotional stuff, I need to go do a psychology degree. I need to go be a therapist. I need to do A, B, C, D, even though I was working with clients and family members and all that, right? So in my head, I was going to go do a PhD in behavioral economics so that I could be good enough to teach this work because then I would be able to say, and I've got this PhD in behavioral economics. And because of that, it means that I can actually talk about money and emotions because I've studied behavioral economics at a PhD level, right? So that was my thinking. But then I thought to myself, where does it end? right? Because behavioral, there's no way in behavioral economics where I'm going to be able to start doing work around the vows of service, right? Where I'm going to do an entire thesis on spiritual vows and Akashic records. So what's next? Once I'm done with the PhD, what is the next thing? I understand that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the PhD. You know, in fact, I would love to go do a PhD in neuroscience, but I want to do it from a space of oh, I'm just fascinated and interested in that versus like I'm doing this PhD to prove a point and to get validation that I am good enough, right? So then I was like, well, I'm going to keep doing more. I'm going to do more, then I'll keep studying more. I'll do more certificates. But then I was like, and then at which point do I actually start earning money? Because I have an MBA and then I did a certificate in entrepreneurship. Then I've been studying and doing more and doing more and doing more. But at which point does it just become enough? that as I am, I am enough. And then I thought to myself, but there's people out there that are running companies and doing this work because they know that the work that they do is valuable and they understand that and they are able to charge for their services for that without having like a million accolades behind their names. Don't get me wrong. Now I feel like a huge, I, I use a lot of my work that I did as a finance honor student and uh, through my MBA in the business and in helping clients um, scale their businesses, right? But my whole point is not that, right? It's not whether or not education is valuable, but it's the fact that for most of us, even one degree, even a master's, even a PhD never feels like it's enough. We always feel like we need to do more, more, more before we can allow ourselves to increase our income, before we can allow ourselves to truly be seen and to show up. And that's what's coming up as we talk to some of our guests that are potential guests in the for the podcast is that what we're reaching, what we're coming up against is this feeling that 
I haven't done enough. So even though people are earning so much money from property and they literally making more than their salaries sometimes from their property business is that, oh, but I watched one of your podcast guests and she had 600 properties. So I am not good enough. Whatever my story is, isn't enough. Not understanding that what you're already doing is incredible and is inspirational to the next person who is at point zero right someone with no properties when they hear that you're making 50 60 70 thousand rand a month from your properties is listening to this and going oh my god i want to be this person and someone who has the money to get there but doesn't have the time is listening and thinking my god what if i put money into her business and then we can just go 50 50 on the next investments and then that just cuts out all the hassles and all the trauma for me in terms of doing this property thing on my own right so suddenly you've got people that are like they have the money to help you up level and they are just waiting to hear from you but you're not showing up right and you being visible and showing up and sharing your story could be the difference between um, expanding, uh, getting to your income goal or your desired goal in, say, 10 years or getting to your desired goal in, say, two years, right? Or someone who is listening to you and is at zero and needs to hear your story because they will resonate with it and that will inspire them to finally get started, right? And they may want to do something with you later on at a later date. So we hold ourselves back in so many ways and it's the same in business, right? So it's not just with the property podcast It's that we show up like this often, even in business is that I haven't done enough. I still have to do more. I still have to have a bunch of accolades behind me before I can truly say that I am really, really great at this. So what I'm going to do now, because I don't feel like I'm good enough or that I am enough is I'm going to work to make myself enough and I'm going to go and get the extra qualifications, the million and one qualifications, which, and then when I get there after maybe four or five years, then I can finally charge the amount that my soul is really asking me to charge at this point right now, right? Forget that like in five years, inflation would have gone up, that amount would have, would be less, right? In terms of what it can buy and what it can do for your business in another five years. And in another five years, other people have gone and done probably what you've been thinking of doing, but you are the best kept secret. So my whole point here is to say, the story that we are not enough and that we're not good enough makes us the best kept secret. There is no logic in having all the knowledge and being like, oh my God, but I'm great at my business and I have all this knowledge and I have all this, but I'm not going to share it and I'm not, I'm not enough. And that knowledge does nothing for you, especially if you're an entrepreneur, right? It just stays there and it doesn't help the people that you're wanting to serve, right? So this is a big thing. And for most people, this may not seem like, I know that if you're a if you've been dealing, if you've never dealt with this, it's probably not an issue. But if you're an entrepreneur and you've been dealing with this and you felt this and you know for some reason you cannot get yourself to up level and you keep trying, you keep trying and you can't up level and you can't get yourself to show up and you can't articulate your value and you can't do any of that, it can be so frustrating. It can feel like the worst thing in the world to know that you want to charge a particular price and you're watching everybody else in the industry charge the prices that you want to charge but you feel like you have to be here for some reason and you can't just go up there and charge right and I'm telling you just doing that inner work and healing that can be really profound one of the things so I said like if you're like me and you're like oh god I've done that whole thing to tell myself that I'm good enough and it's not working because I tried it I would do the positive self-talk and it just didn't work for me for some of us it just doesn't work right a lot of it is because it comes from deep trauma right a lot of times it comes from trauma from childhood trauma right 
right? Where we have been taught through many different um, ways and how we were brought up that we are not enough, that we're not good enough. And then we kind of embodied it as adults. So we've learned how to protect ourselves from the criticism, from other people's criticism, other people's rejection, and from people telling us that we are not good enough. So we don't want to step out of that because the trauma is we don't we're scared to experience the same pain except that we are experiencing the pain because you are here you want to expand you want to do the work that you want to do you want to be paid uh, for the work that you want to do without having to have like a gazillion clients or go from pillar to post or go and do like a five-year degree or a two-year degree or three-year degree that you have no interest in right and that that in itself is a kind of pain and a kind of trauma so there has to be the healing of go of going into the into the spaces where you were taught that and literally going to heal those moments healing that child it can also be past life memories right so i know for me one of my big things comes from a lifetime i had one of my key things around not being good enough, right, wasn't actually just from this lifetime. I have a past life where I was um, um, where I was a sex worker in the 16th or 17th century, in the 1600s anyway. And I keep going back to that lifetime and how people treated me. Like I see myself walking down the streets where there's not even wagons really, more like horses and like all these women dressed up and how they would treat me. And one woman literally spat on me, right? And that just reinforced that belief. So I literally had to go into... Um, um, the meditation. So what we do in the Money Magic course is we use the not good enough meditation and uh, we use the vow of invisibility meditation. So there's two different vows of invisibility meditations. One of them is going into the Akashic Records and then it will literally take you into a past life. So I used that meditation from the course to be able to go into that memory and start healing that part of me and just allowing her to see that she's not in the same life situation and not only is she not in the same life situation there is nothing wrong with sex work right and I mean this is like three four hundred years ago so it's like having to heal those aspects of me and be with it and feel the pain and feel all those things like walking down the streets and being treated the way that I was treated right and so working on healing those memories so my whole point is sometimes those memories are not even the trauma isn't from this lifetime it's from other lifetimes and one of the crazy things for me was it's funny because in that memory one of the things that I also noticed in in that past life memory was that I was I felt safest in the brothel house right and this is an actual true story in this lifetime guess where I would go when I would run away from home in my teens yeah I ran away to brothel houses right because for me that was the one place where I also felt where the part of my soul that remembered that lifetime remembered that the place where I felt safe and accepted was amongst all those other women that were doing the same work as me. So in this lifetime, I have spent my I spent part of my teens in brothel houses. Um, I haven't done any sex work in this lifetime, right? Uh, not that there's anything wrong with it because while well, I was living um, with the women and they took care of me when I was in my teens for a part of the time because that was where I felt safest. So it was also, it uh, also helped me explain so much about the choices that I made as a teenager, which for most, uh, for my family, it was like, why would you go there? Why would you run away there and all that? And for me, it was like, that's where I feel safest though. And then I could understand that and help that part of me heal and say, it's okay. You know, it's okay that you feel safe, that this is where you felt safest, but now you have 
different work to do. Now you have this aspect of work to do in this lifetime and let's work with this trauma and heal it so that you don't feel this constant fear. Because I used to have this fear that if I showed up in front of you guys, be it in person or be it in online videos like this, that people would spit at me. People would um, get violent with me, right? Part of that is from this lifetime, but part of that is also from the past lives, right? So understanding that some of our traumas, the soul is eternal and the soul carries um, so much good and bad, whatever we term to be good and bad, right, carries all that from all its various lifetimes. And that's just, uh, and that some of those things need to be healed in order for you to progress in this lifetime. So that's how we, that's how I do the work with uh, students and clients in the Money Magic course or one-on-one is literally using guided meditations and um, going into various points in their lifetimes. Yeah, and we do a lot of past lives, funny enough, with, uh, with my clients, but yeah. So that's, um, that's the one aspect. Now let's talk about the vow of invisibility and collective trauma, because I think that is very big and how that also ties into not good enough. So for most people, especially I think more so South Africans and um, maybe African Americans as well, but also maybe other countries that, you know, other countries carry the same collective trauma. But if you have a deep history of oppression, like say South Africa, and there has been a systematic, um, what do we call, how do I phrase this? But like a systematic effort. Yeah, effort is the right word. But it's like a systematic effort to convince part of the population that they are worthless, right? The first few years, like say maybe in the 1700s or the 1800s, yeah, people would have been like, yeah, whatever, get out of my face. Of course, I'm amazing, I'm worthy, I am more than enough, I am good enough, I am amazing, not a big deal. But then fast forward to 200 years of doing that, say in the early 1900s, right? To two hundreds of uh, to about two hundred years of doing that of taking people's land of making them feel like they are not good enough because you've taken their land and you keep telling their descendants that over and over again. And I was saying to um, the fall in love with the bank account uh, students last uh, two weeks ago, I think, or was it last week? I can't remember. But I was saying to them that. If you told, like, look at the impact this pandemic is having on us on a psychic level. And that's only been about two months or one month for most of us, right? And already our mental health is deteriorating. Already the way that we face the world is um, changing, right? Already political systems are changing, countries are changing, people are changing. There are stories of how people can't leave their house anymore, how certain people now have agoraphobia. We see how like we're having anxiety attacks, panic attacks, how we were not just okay within ourselves, right? And this is just from about a month or two of a pandemic. Now imagine what that, what 400 years of oppression does to a people, right? Imagine what that does to us in terms of trauma and our descendants. We can already see how just from one month or two months of co- of um, teaching our own children is changing the relationship that people have with their children, right? So mothers are starting to talk about that. That's just from a month. Now, and that's just from a month because of something that has happened externally. In the same way, apartheid, slavery, colonization, these are things that happened externally that then affected us, except it's not been 30 days, right? It's been generations and it's been generational. So we're talking about 
hundreds of years in South Africa, right? We're talking about where you look at a country like South Africa, where we're talking about slaves being brought in, people being enslaved. We're talking about colonization. We're talking about apartheid. We are talking about hundreds of years of oppression. And do you can you imagine if 30 days has changed our, our selves and who we are and the way that we relate to our children? so drastically what 400 years or 300 years of oppression has done to us as a people that is what trauma does right trauma isn't that we are divorced from the environment right so if you tell a people long enough that they are not good enough that they are not equal that they are uh, that they are worthless that they are not even human and you keep dehumanizing them at some point, some of the people are going to be affected and it won't be just some. You do it enough times, you change the system, the actual political systems, you change the economic systems, you change everything to reflect that for years, for centuries, right? It is going to affect how people see themselves, how they think. Just think what 30 days of a pandemic or um, two months of its pandemic has already done. So this is the same thing, right? So when you are oppressing people and you're telling them that they are not enough, that they're not good enough, which we have experienced in South Africa for centuries, it starts to affect how we see ourselves. It starts to affect our self-perception, right? And when you have laws that have actively worked to invisibilize you and invisibilize people who look like you, people who came before you, who looked like you, it will start to impact the way that we show up. It makes us want to be invisible, right? It aids, we basically start thinking that is the norm, that we are not enough, that we have to do more to be on par. That's why we have sayings like we need to work twice as hard to be uh, to have what a, half of what they have and we take it on but whoever said that we have to work twice as hard you know we have made it part of our sayings part of of who we are so we make sure that we are never ever visible until we are perfect and we have dotted all the t we have crossed all the t's and we can dot all the i's but what that does is it keeps us it holds us back because it means that before we can launch any dream before we can launch anything we actively have to be perfect in anything and we don't allow ourselves to be visible until we are fully perfect and the thing is that there is no such thing as perfection right so it's such a deep issue so we also have to be aware that we what we're carrying is a lot of ancestral trauma and this is where the ancestral work starts and begins because we need to start tracing back as we do the work and sometimes we don't even know that we carry this right this is why i love using guided meditations and doing the guided journeys spiritual journeys that i do in the money magic course because it's about going into parts of the psyche that you didn't know, right? Where you allow those ancestors, because sometimes if, as we do the meditations, we'll realize that, hell, this is not my story. I didn't dress like that. And I, it doesn't feel like a past life. So the person that I'm seeing in there is not that person. It's got to be an ancestor, right? So it's also about healing those ancestors and healing their stories because we are carrying those stories within us and they are impacting the way that we see ourselves. And because the way that we see ourselves impacts the way that we show up, it is impacting how we show up right? And not only that, but it's impacting how we charge for our products and services. It impacts how we show up to market our products and services. And it also then impacts how, we're, uh, how much money we're allowing ourselves to save. Because if there's a deep part of me that tells me that people like me, because that's what the society has told me, that's what the external environment has told me for years or told people like me for centuries, that people like me cannot ma have more than X amount in a savings account. Do you think that I will give myself permission to have more than X amount in my savings account? No, 
because deep down my sense my my identity depends on how I perceive myself. So if we can change how we see ourselves and change how we relate to ourselves, it changes so much as well. But a lot of that is ancestral trauma. It is past life trauma. It is this lifetime trauma, right? So guys, let me know if you resonate with what I've said. Hi, Mary. Hi, Unati. Hi, um, hi, Lisa. Lisa, you say, see, I'm on, huh? <laughs> yeah, okay, hi, hi, Lisa. So, and hi, Polite. Yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that, you guys. Um, I hope this resonates and it makes sense. And if you are seeing part of yourself in this from all that I've shared and you want to know more about the Money Magic course, you can hit me up via inbox and I'll also post the link to the Money Magic course um, in the description of this video. You can go check it out at wealthy-money.com forward slash money magic. Again, wealthy-money.com forward slash money magic. The course is open for registration until May 15th. So the Money Magic course is open. It's life time access we do a heck of a lot of work on going deeper into money trauma and in particular ancestral trauma working with our own individual trauma past life trauma I don't like I can never know <laughs> what trauma it is that is holding anyone back right and sometimes it's not even a big thing because most times trauma isn't the biggest thing like for someone listening to me, yeah, people spat on me on a roadside and it wasn't like a group of people. It was like one woman really that spat on me um, on the side of the road in that memory. But to me, my entire body, my stomach was a knot. Everything was just like, oh my God, that was a big trauma for me. For someone with maybe like, so someone spattered you, whatever, get over it. But a trauma is something that your soul has a hard time processing and integrating. And my soul in that lifetime had a hard time processing it and integrating it. And guess what? In this lifetime, same thing. Like just the very mere thought of that used to send me under the covers and freak me out. So understand that trauma is not always like the big things. It's not just about the big oppression, etc. But so many things happen that cause us to make the vows that we make around being invisible. And most times we make the vows that we make in order to protect ourselves. So most times I can imagine that most people, most African people um, globally would have made the decision to be invisible, our ancestors in particular, because it kept them safe. Because seeing, uh, being seen in a world where you didn't have a lot of power it meant that people could either lynch you if you were in the US right um, lynch you and kill you or if you were in South Africa people could beat you up hurt you do whatever and you would have absolutely no legal recourse because you had no power so one of the ways that we learned to survive was to be invisible but now things have changed we don't have to hold on to those vows right they don't um, there's no reason for us to keep holding on to them because they no longer get uh, the situ uh, the um, situation has changed but maybe our ancestors don't know that and the parts of us that are holding on to those vows for our ancestors don't know that that it's safe and don't feel safe and it's our job to start healing those parts and healing those ancestors so have a fantastic day you guys namaste